Under the next introduction, Nefarious Wars, the Great Introduction, Nefarious Wars, the Main Great Protection, presents the Holy Circle Part 1. Father has just finished in his confession. Please speak now. Please speak to the Holy Father.
Ce da mus in pace, in nomine Christi,
Dominus Vobis tu, et un spiritu tu, sequentia sancti evangeli, secundo Luca. Gloria Tibi Domine.
Epistle for this feast of the purification of Our Lady, February the 2nd, taken from the book of Malachi, chapter 3. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And presently there shall come to his temple the Lord whom you seek, and the messenger of the covenants whom you desire. Behold, he comes, saith the Lord of hosts. But who shall endure the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's lyre. And he shall sit refining and purifying the silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and shall refine them as gold and as silver, 
and you shall offer sacrifices to the Lord in justice. Then the sacrifices of Judah and Jerusalem shall please the Lord, as in the days of old and in the ancient years, says the Lord Almighty. And in the Gospel, we that according to St. Luke chapter 2. At that time when the days of the purification of Mary were fulfilled, according to the law of Moses, they took Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was in Jerusalem a man named Simeon, and his name, this man was just and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Christ and the of the Lord. And he came by inspiration of the, of the Spirit into the temple. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he also received him into his arms and blessed God, saying, Now thou dost dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word in peace, because mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and a glory for thy people Israel. Let's follow the words of today's holy gospel. Amen, <clears throat> Father, and Son of the Ghost, amen. Today is a day in the society of confined to tent, where we take on the cassock, a very simple ceremony, a very sacred day. In the old days before Vatican II, when you would go into a seminary, you just go into the seminary, and the first day you arrive, you put on the cassock. And then when you leave, you take off the cassock. And the cassock was simply just simply the sign of the seminarian, who would also one day hopefully become a priest. But we wait for a few months to receive this sacred uh, statement of the cassock because of the attack against the holiness of the priesthood, because of the despising of the cassock, priests, Seminarians, religious, have thrown off their habits. They've thrown off their cassocks in the last 50 years since Vatican II. And why have they done so? And also, this the, today, the Feast of Purification is a very beautiful day on which to receive the cassock. It's our sacred day in the Society of St. Pius X when we receive the cassock. And it is a very worthy day for it because it is a day in which the Church considers the preparation of the priest, among many other things, the preparation. Notice in the, in the epistle, it says that then the sacrifices shall be, uh, the, 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 the priest offers sacrifice, but he is. The priesthood is holy, and the priesthood is always holy. Christ is holy, and he's always holy. But the man that becomes a priest, he's not always holy. And the man that stands at the altar does not always please him to God. And though there are many sacrifices offered by God, the Lord has determined one of the great mysteries of his salvation. The Mass is always holy. The Church is always holy. Priesthood is always holy. So then there should be no difference between a Church which has a Giuseppe Sarto as Pope, St. Pius X, a Church that has Hildebrand as Pope, St. Gregory VII, or a Church that has Bergoglio as Pope, Pope Francis, or Pope Benedict, or Pope John Paul II. There should be no difference between a parish of a priest who is uh, married. There are many such priests and parishes today, and who are living in sin, saying the Mass, and the priests of the parish of St. John Vianney. St. John Vianney said the Mass, and many a wicked priest said the Mass. St. Pius X was a pope, and Bergoglio was a pope. And the church, the papacy, is just as holy with St. Pius X as it is today. And the priesthood is just as holy with St. John Vianney as it is in any parish church where a priest has a true faith and celebrates a true mass. Not in a church where there is a false mass. Not in a church where there is a false faith. But in a church where there is a true mass and true faith, it is just as holy as ours. So why did not Satan say, 
Why did he not say, if I had one more equal mass like all the other masses, my kingdom would have already been destroyed. If the mass spreads throughout the entire world, my kingdom will be destroyed. If there are churches in every country, my kingdom will be destroyed. If there is a Catholic in every country, my kingdom will be destroyed. He rather said, if there are three more like John Vianney, that simple parish priest of ours, if there is another one like Anthony of the Desert, if there is another one like, like, like the great saints, by addition of all the saints, you can name each of them, if there are too many of these saints, another Bernard, another Hildebrand, my kingdom will be destroyed. There is the holiness of the church. There is the holiness of the priesthood. There is the holiness of the mass. There is the holiness of the cassock. The holiness of the incense. The devil knows wisely. He knows so very well. You know what he is allowing right now? He is allowing Latin masses all over the church. He is allowing incense all over the church. Why is he doing this? He is looking for compromised souls because what's he terrified of? A saint. He is terrified of a Hildebrand who fought against the great wickedness of an age who was almost as wicked as ours. He is terrified of Athanasius. He is terrified of John Vianney. He is terrified of Giuseppe Sarto, St. Pius X. He is terrified at this very moment. He knows that there must be saints of each age, and each of us is called to be saints, every one of us. There are no exceptions, and yet, most of the time, the devil is not afraid. We're all given grace to become saints. Why are there so few? And what is the sacredness of this cassock and the sacredness of this holy priesthood? St. Augustine says about this day of the February the 2nd, taking of the, the, the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who did not need to be purified. Bringing the child to the temple. They were poor. And it says in the Old Testament what's required. And each of these three things refers to the priesthood. The young man shall be considered holy. God should in fact require all to offer sacrifice to him. But he has chosen only some to be pulled aside for that sacred sacrifice. Not only in the New Testament, but the most sacred sacrifice of the Mass. But from the very beginning of time, there must be sacrifice. Cain offered sacrifice. Abel offered sacrifice. Adam had to offer sacrifice. And there must be sacrifice to the glory of God until the end of time. There must be the knowledge and love of God at the end of time. And there must be the proclaiming of the true God to all men and to all creatures until the end of time. And even the pagan Greek Pendor, the pagan Greek Pendor said that singing is holy. It is the right of the priest to sing. And even in ancient Greek, the lay people were not allowed to sing. The priesthood is holy and communicates in a sacred way to God. The priest sings to God. And what does he do? He sings the glory of his creation. He sings the glory of all things that are made for his glory. And he returns them with his own free will to give glory to God. The tree needs man. The rock needs man. The tree gives glory to God because it has to give glory to God. The rock gives glory to God because it's made beautiful by God to be hard and to do what rocks do. The dog gives glory to God and all the creatures made by God give him glory. Because of their beauty and magnificence. But they don't do it freely. And therefore there's something missing. And God completed creation by creating man. And he said, I've made all these things for you. I made the stars for you. Look up into them and see Virgo. Look into them and see the Southern Cross. Look into them and see the symbols of heaven. Look up into them and remind yourself of the perfection of heaven. For the stars shall give glory to God freely by man giving them meaning. And by man looking to them and finding what God has hid inside of them, which is beauty and perfection. And God gave to man the ability to elevate the ants. All ye sluggards, look to the ant. You're lazy, look at an ant. And analyze the ants. Look at the ant. They will teach you how to work. 
And then you, by looking at the ant and seeing the glory of the ant, will return glory to God. And the priest touches everything. He touches the trees. They must be made into altars. They will be made into the things of the glory of God. He touches gold, which shall be used for a chalice. He touches silver to use for a chalice, for the sacred vessels. He touches the, the plants that will be used for clothing. He touches all things to be used for the sacred vestments and for the glory of God. And therefore, he fulfills the most important purpose of man to take the unholy, to take the things that are already good in themselves and with his free will give them in a special way and glory to God. And that's why a priest, he's holy just like a rock is holy. I have a holiness of the priesthood in me whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, whether I get mad before Mass or don't. The fact is, is the holiness of the priesthood is here. The holiness of the priesthood is there whether I'm on a good day or a bad day. But is that all that's required? No. And hence the priest's sacrifices will not always be pleasing to God. And that is why it says in Malachi, after they've been tried by the fuller's fire, after they've been burnt in the fire, after the young man has been burnt and burnt and tried, then his sacrifices shall become pleasing. But who shall endure the day of his coming? And who shall stand it when he appears? He is like the refiner's fire, like the fuller's lyre. And he shall sit refining and purifying the silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. That's what happens with the holiness of the priesthood. We give you the cassock early in order to remind you because you don't know what a cassock is. When we get ordained priests, we receive the power to hold Jesus Christ in our hands. The power to lift him up in the air. The power to absolve sins. The power to speak the very words of Christ as Christ himself when we say, this is my body. We don't know what priesthood is. We don't know what holiness is, though we are it, living it every day. There must be a trying by fire. There must be a purification. And not all come through the fire alive. Not all. As Saint, as, as our Saint Paul, the greatest of all the priests and apostles, ever said, "Children, I would not have you ignorant. All pass through the sea. Every priest was ordained. Every priest before Vatican II and traditional priest, no longer after Vatican II, but every priest received a cassock. Every priest was able to celebrate a mass. Martin Luther celebrated the mass." Rampola celebrated the Mass. And so so along with many others who now burn in the fires of hell. There must be a trying by the fire. It is the most sacred thing to be a priest of God. And God wants priests who will use their free will without being forced to adore him as God and not fall for heresy. Who will be responding to his holy grace that he gives to everyone. But who is responding to that grace? He demands that there must be apostles that will be fire tried. Can you go through a fire and come out the other side? So many collapse today and they don't make it through the fire. You do not know that when there is a fire coming, it purifies the forest. When there is a fire coming, it purifies the gold. When there is a fire coming, it purifies, says the Holy Ghost, the sons of Levi. So many young men become priests because they did their research. Priests get special treatment. Priests get to stay in anybody's house and they don't have to pay for it. Priests get nice, big, fancy steaks and nice dinners. Priests get treated with love and respect. Priests get all kinds of privileges. And when you walk by, people give you money. Oh, you're cool. I think it's a great idea. Simon Magus thought it was a great idea. And there are many such priests. They are weighed down with blackness in their lives. They turn to depression. They must find comfort in something other than the fire of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they turn away from him to sin. And then they burn forever in hell. But they are not just forever burning in hell. They are miserable in this life before they go to hell. 
Where is the joy of the priesthood? It's mentioned a little bit by St. Jerome and St. Augustine today. The Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. They came to the temple on the 40th day. And they brought two turtle doves. They brought two doves. They weren't rich enough to bring a lamb. They weren't rich enough to bring a lamb. The lamb will be brought to the slaughter. So they, in their poverty, they brought two turtle doves. And these doves were offered to the priest, for they signified two sides of the priesthood. The priest is going to take these little doves. He's going to kill them. He's going to sacrifice them. And we're reminded that we are born in this world to die. And that's the reason why the casket is black. We are dead to this world. Everyone, everyone that is born of this world must die. And the priest is going to take those turtle doves and he's going to kill them. He's going to sacrifice them in a holocaust to the Lord. And so there will be death. And we all know we're born to death. It wasn't supposed to be that way. But Eve and Adam decided otherwise. And because of Adam's original sin, we are born with death. And now what is the answer to death? The priesthood is the answer to death. And he wears black. Why does he wear black? Because our first meeting, says St. Augustine, with Christ is dread. There are two happy little married doves. One of them is going to become a widow or a widower. They're going to be killed. And there is going to be death. And the other one shall mourn. So they shall come and there shall be dread because they're going to die and they're going to be killed. And it is given for all men to die and after death the judgment. And so because of death entering into the world, there is great sorrow in the world. And there is the double death, the death of the body, which we all must experience, and the death of the soul, which we all begin. We begin with a dead soul. So we already begin dead in our souls. We have original sin. Then it follows by death of the body. And the priest comes, and the first thing you see is a priest. He's a man in black. The modern church hates that. He's negative. He preaches death, and he does. You are all going to die. Our first meeting with Christ is death and dread. We're going to face death. Since we're all going to face death, we need to go to the man who knows about death. What's he going to do? He's going to tell us we're going to face death. But then he's going to turn death into life. And he's going to transform death. He's going to take it from death. So we will find that there are two things that happen in blackness. One, of course, is death. The other is rest. We sleep in the night. It is also the time of rest. And so the blackness also is a time of rest when we store up our energy for a new day. And black also reminds us that there's going to be a new day. That new day is the day of heaven. That new place is the place of the brightness of heaven. And the priest walks around in his black. When they first see him, he's a negative guy, telling everybody they're going to hell, telling everybody they're committing sin, telling everybody they're going to die, and all that their life is... And this world is a waste of time. And all things that they look into this world are not valuable. They're empty. He's negative. But what does he do? He brings treasures. Now when the dove dies, says St. Augustine, the other one doesn't marry again. He has only one mate. For the turtle dove, the dove, sig turtle dove signifies chastity. Only one love for all of life. If the other dies, there is no second love. So it is with the priest. He has only one love. It's the reason why the priest cannot marry. He cannot love two women. He cannot love his holy mother of the church and a woman of this world. He cannot love the Blessed Virgin Mary and a woman of this world. He cannot love God and, the, and the, 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 the woman of this world. His love is only of the things of God. He has only one mate. And he is dead to the love of this world. They're beginning that journey. It'll be a time before they make the vow of that love. And they become some deacons. But they must go on that path. We begin with dread and we end in love, says St. Augustine. Dread is just the beginning. Whereas with the devil, you begin with two seconds of pleasure and you end with eternal dread. And even the pleasure is not pleasure. The pleasure quickly goes away and turns into misery. But the dread remains. But when we come to Christ, we begin with dread, 
and the dread quickly goes away and is transformed into joy. But there must be a trying of the fire. There must be sorrow. There must be a watching. There has to be. You have the sacredness of this cassock. You carry it as a witness. We are made for another world. And that all men are made for another world. If the cassock only signified priests are made for another world, no one would be bothered. Well, he doesn't live in the world. He's, he's somewhere else. Okay, have a nice time. It'd be like seeing the Amish. When you see the Amish, they, they ride around in little carts. That's neat. Now turn the air conditioner on. <laughs> Boy, it's got to be cold out there. Turn the heater up. Well, they have this neat black hat, you know, hanging on a baseball cap. You're not bothered when you see the Amish. Because the Amish are enemies of God. They do not hold the true faith. And they don't have any demands on anyone else. But when you see that black cassock, what can I got? I don't like to see that. I have to change my life. I don't like to see that. Happens all the time. Remember many, many times in the airport. Many, many times. Totally packed in the airport. 50,000 people going in line. And they're all mad and talking about this and talking about that. And the priest sat in line with his black cassock. And then I remember many, many times, somebody said, and that's why I told him to go. He's a rotten guy, no good for nothing. That's why I told him to go to church. <laughs> what are you talking about church? Oh, yeah, you've got to pray more. And all of a sudden, everybody's talking about praying more and going to church because they saw the Padre. Because they know when you see that black cassock, it doesn't mean he's a good man. He might be a horrible man. It doesn't mean he's holy. It means I, who am not in a cassock, must be a good man. I, who am not in a cassock, must be holy. I, who am not in a cassock, must turn to God. I, who am not in a cassock, must go to confession. I heard my first confession when I had a cassock for about four months. Now my cassock, February the 2nd. I came down here to Kentucky, and on the way down, I think it was in Chicago, a man said, Father, I need you to hear my confession. He said, well, I can hear it. I said, that's not a problem. Just can't give you absolution. I'm not a priest. He goes, well, I'm not a priest. He goes, don't worry about it. So he gave me his full confession. Even though I couldn't give him absolution. Even though I was 19, 18 years old at the time. He saw the cassock. Told him he couldn't give him absolution. Told him I'm not a priest yet. I don't care if he's like a Tell me you did your confession. Because the black cassock doesn't mean we are as Amish running around. It doesn't mean we're wearing the old style clothing of the 1800s. The cassock signifies holiness that everyone is required to achieve. And the cassock signifies that all were made for God. And it signifies that we are all connected to the priesthood. Why do you get baptized? Why is the holy oil placed upon the chest, the front of the shoulders, and on the back of the soldiers to receive Christ? Christ comes from the priesthood. It's the priest that pours the water over the head and makes us enter into the church. We are connected to the priesthood. It's the passive priesthood, the receiving of the gifts of the priesthood, but it's a connection to the priesthood. Every man must be connected to the priest in order to go to heaven, and they know that. Even the pagans know that. That's why they have their own pagan priests. Even though they're evil priests, they know they must have a priest. They know they must have a priest to speak to God for them. And the priest weeps, says St. Jerome. He weeps. Two great things of the turtle dove signifies. Chastity of the priest. And he weeps. Because when the husband dies, the one that's still alive weeps. And weeping is a necessary part of the priesthood. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the priests weep between the, the, uh, the, the porch and the altar, praying for the so souls. We know also, what do you say, Father, pray for me. One of the duties of the priest is to weep. Let there be no confusion about this. Our Lord Jesus Christ stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus. And he wept. He wept. You know that weeping is a necessary part of the priesthood. No man can be a priest of God who knows not tears. No man can be a priest of God who does not weep. And where is the place of weeping? It is here in the church. This is the place of weeping. 
The priest must take his holy bravery and holy divine office. He must take the cares and worries of his people. And what does St. Paul says? Which of you is not in trouble and I am not on fire? He buries the burdens of all his sheep. And the priest must learn to bury the burdens of the sheep. That is the reason why the devil strongly tempts the priest to selfishness and materialism. Because he's terrified of the priest who carries the burdens of others. He's terrified of the priest that weeps because of the sorrows of others. He is petrified of this priest because one day the priest of all priests wept. And what was the first thing that the people noticed? See how he loves them. St. Francis Xavier used to talk about that. St. Francis Xavier used to speak to his missionary Jesuits. He says, what must you do to be a good missionary? What do you have to do? Francis Xavier says, there are two things you must do. You must love your sheep. You must love them. You must love them. You must love them. And teach them also to love you. And through loving you, to love God. But you must love the sheep. You must love them. And St. Matthew Xavier says you must love the sheep. You go to the sheep and you love the sheep. That means you must carry the burdens of the sheep. You must care for the sheep. And this is a great difficulty. Because as the priest goes through many battles in life, he sees many people fall away. He sees many people deceive. He sees many people lie. He sees many people fail. And he easily becomes like an old hardened soldier. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I did this, I did that. Yeah, yeah, everybody else says that too, and they don't mean anything. I'm going to help you, Father. Yeah, 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 I've heard that one before. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. And they become bitter. And love goes out from their hearts. And then they must find comfort in something else. So it's found in wine. It's found in alcohol. It's found in the pleasures of the world. It's found in distractions. One day they become the most grave, the most problem of the, the biggest problem the priest must avoid. That is, tepidity, spiritual sloth, achavia, kills their souls. What does it say in the day on the consecration of a church? Locus iste sanctus es, in quo ora sacerdos. This is a holy place in which the priest prays. All this begins by the taking of the cassock. Young man who's studying for the priesthood must be very familiar with the holy altar. Must be very familiar with the church. He must be able to frequently come into the church and always say, Merge with me a sinner. Let him not waste his trip. Every time he comes to the church, that must be in some way repeating the wor words of the publican, O Lord, be merciful to me a sinner. Always must be repeated. And then he must come into the church and he must, he must beg forgiveness for his sins. Come into the church and carry his troubles. He must make a preparation. And for the time of God allows for the major orders to come, and God allows for the priesthood to come, never a single day without one hour in the presence of our Lord. Never. Many things, the whole priesthood began during those three hours of the agony. And we can say during those three hours of the agony, Peter, James, and John, they were not yet saints. And they didn't do very well during those three hours. They didn't do very well at all. But they were there. They were there. And the other nine were not there. And they were there, says St. Augustine, because they were the three most sacred apostles. The first, the first, and the first. Now consider those three apostles during those three hours of the agony on Holy Thursday night. You have the first beloved, St. John, the first head, of course, of the church, St. Peter, and the first martyr, St. James, the first who shed his blood. What should God have done? I chose Peter, James, and John. Watch an hour with me, and then I'm going to make you the first pope. I'm going to make you the first martyr. I'm going to make you my most beloved, and you're always going to be my most beloved. He comes back, and they're sleeping. All right, one more chance. Remember, one strike, two strike, three strike, and then you're out. This is the way of the world. They strike out the first time because they cannot stay awake. They strike out the second time because they cannot stay awake. They strike out the third time because they cannot stay awake. And after they have slept during the majority of these three hours, but they didn't sleep during all those hours, they were awake for part of it, maybe five minutes for one, 
maybe 15 for another, maybe as long as 30 for another. So they were awake and they slept. They were awake and they slept. But they were not awake the whole hour. And our Lord said, could you not watch one hour with me? I ask you to watch one hour. And they failed. So what should he do? All right, I'm going to take three other apostles, three that can stay awake. I'm going to find three apostles that can stay awake. Peter, you're fired. John, you're fired. And James, you're fired. No, i got to go to battle. I want to let you know, you're fired. I remember when we were playing basketball in Winona. And we went to the we went to the St. Teresa's and we used to play basketball all the time. All of a sudden, there's no sort of lady who wouldn't let us play basketball with anymore. And so she kicked us out. And Father Stanich was with us at seminary. And he goes, when I become a priest, I get ordained. I want to be assigned here just so my first thing I'm going to do as a priest, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> first thing I'm going to do. And then I'm going to quit. <laughs> so he's going to become a priest. He's going to fire her. And he's going to quit. He was not happy. He wasn't allowed to play basketball. But our Lord Jesus Christ, why did he not fire them? Peter failed. John failed. And James failed. And they failed three times. And he did not fire them. They weren't asleep the whole time. And then what, at the end of the three hours, what did he say? What did our Lord Jesus Christ say? He said, sleep now and take your rest. Now it's time to sleep and take your rest. And they didn't sleep. When he told them to stay awake, they slept. When he told them to sleep, they followed him. And they didn't stay awake. They didn't go to sleep. Why, is, why does God allow this? One reason for this is that we must suffer like Christ. We are all told to do that. He suffered for one hour of bloody sweat without one instant of break. And then he says, all right, I want you to suffer with me, you young priest. You have to experience a few stabs in the back. You have to experience a few sorrows. You have to experience being despised. You have to experience being hated. You have to experience all those things that I experienced for one continuous hour. What did you get? Three minutes? And 57 minutes of snooze time. You didn't experience for three hours, and our Lord, three minutes. Our Lord said, the flesh indeed is weak. The spirit indeed is weak, but the, the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So does our Lord allow failures to be priests? We only have 12 examples of those first priests, and they all have one thing in common. They were all failures. They didn't succeed. But he made them priests. Only one of them remained a failure, and that was Judas, and it's because he didn't rise from his failures. He thought he failed so bad that he could not be forgiven. He thought he failed so bad that he could not return to God, and that was his failure. The other apostles all failed miserably, all of them. Three of them failing worse than the others. They all failed a little, but the three that failed the most, Peter, James, and John. And they were still made the first of the apostles. And they were still made the greatest of them because they rose from their sleep. And what do they recognize? As St. Thomas Thomas would tell us in the battle between the Thomas and the Molinists. What would they tell us? Because the grace of God is more powerful than the foolishness of man. We only have to respond. But the grace of God is more powerful and so he failed. But our Lord shows Peter. Moses. Moses said, I quit before he could even begin the race. I want you to save my people. Sorry, not going to do it. Even before he quit, first thing he did was quit. He should be the modernist. He should be the example of all modern guys. They quit before the race starts. First thing he did was quit. No, you must be the man. No, I quit. You must be the one. No, I quit. You must be the one. But I stutter. All right, I'll let your, your brother go with you, but you're still the one. When our Lord Jesus Christ makes up his mind, it's not easily changed. He calls many. Only a few are chosen, but he calls many. And we must have the grace to respond and be amongst those chosen ones. They slept for most of those three hours, but they were awake for part of it, and they tried in their weakness so do not be afraid. Our Lord says, take up your cross and follow me. And we take up our cross and we follow him. It turns out our cross is made out of Nerf material, styrofoam, painted with nice realistic painting. 
Because you've got great artists nowadays. They can make it look like solid lead. They can make it, they'll say, 5,000 pounds on it. Only it's made out of styrofoam. And when you fall on top of it, it sure beats falling on the ground. Those are hard rocks. But we're taking up our cross. And it says 1,000 pounds. Somebody just forgot to mention that it's styrofoam. But when we take up our cross and follow Christ, we do have to take up our cross. We do have to follow him. We will discover he'll never give us a big cross. And though he says, stay awake for the whole hour and sweat blood for the whole hour, he'll let us sleep and then he'll come back and complain. But don't worry about the complaints. Give us the strength to stay awake for another five minutes. Maybe it's three minutes awake in the first hour. Maybe it's ten minutes awake in the second hour. Maybe it's 15 minutes awake in the third hour. Well, that's something. He still chose Peter, James, and John. God is the one who does the choosing. And this is one of the foolishness and weaknesses of temptations of many a seminarian who leaves the priest who leaves the seminary when he should not. He forgets that it is a vocation. Vocation means someone else calls, not you. If I'm an idiot, yeah. So what else is new? Especially if you're in the resistance, you have to be a special idiot. Not a normal idiot, but a special idiot. But the fact is, like Father Giselle said, the world is filled with nuts. But the creme de la creme joins the SSPX. And we are the creme de la creme de la creme. And so, this is the way it is. But God, why does God allow this? Why does he do this? Because he wants to remind to every age against the great sin of man of every single age. What is our great sin? It's pride. Therefore, he, in each age, will choose the weak. He will choose the foolish. He will choose those who are of the lower echelon of society in one way or another. In order to confound the strong. He has done this in each age. That's how he chose Gideon. That's how he chose Moses. Moses is called the most meek. It was said by the fathers he was the most meek. But he wasn't meek when he was young. He murdered the taskmaster. He was a murderer. Murderers and meekness don't usually go together. But by after the grace of God, he was most meek. St. Francis de Sales is supposed to be extremely hot-tempered. But he was most meek and most gentle. The grace of God is more powerful than our weakness. And we must be patient. And let the holiness of the priesthood, let the holiness of the holy bravery, without the bravery, no priest can survive. Just holding it in the hand has saved many a soul. No more priest came back to the priesthood. He couldn't get rid of his bravery. He couldn't throw it away. He threw away everything else, but he couldn't throw that away, even though he didn't say it, just kept it. And one day, looking at that holy book, brought him back to Christ. And so the fact is that we must remember the holiness of the, of the priesthood is there to sanctify us. The casting is holy, even if I'm not always holy. The mass is holy, even if I'm not always holy. The priesthood is holy even I'm not always holy. But why is it? Why does God put that excessive holiness there? And that some of it may rub off over a period of years. And some of it may rub off on the soul. And more and more we will become like unto Christ. And be able to stay awake for a whole five minutes. A whole 15 minutes during an hour. And that will be a great victory for us. He'll never let us suffer as he suffered. But so it's a beautiful day to receive this holy cassock. And to carry it as a sample example to the world not to ourselves but to the world that the world needs Christ the world needs a true faith the world needs a true mass the world needs Catholic Christendom reestablished and there is no other way to save it than that and the black cassock is a reminder of that and a great blessing and so I'll say they, they receive the cassock and wear it well and also pray for the Perseverance of seminarians and also vocations and future vocations. May God send many laborers into the harvest. The harvest indeed is great, but the laborers are few. Blessing God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Kalau masih di mana dan Dami masih di sini. Oh, Dami dia itu pusing itu tega men. Nos kemo kalau tadi pun dua orang yang delgi hati tes. Ok di kramo semen sam tu elai tadi kot aku bedam siam. Tu ok jengus testamenti kot santi patres. Ad no tensiye mel under tadi pun jicien. Deponentes ignominiam seculares per habitus peris sancerum qui tu ita benedicere digeri. Tu di family tui, di family tuis vestimentis te quoque enduari in meriantur. Et tibi agnostantur, agnostantur, esse dicatis, dicati, filius reinas, deus in sicula, sicula.